Welcome, everyone, to episode number 106 of Underserved. Joining me today is Paul Dingwitz, CTO at the Zeal Network. Let's get started. Welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry, where we focus on stories of tech industry leaders, their insights, and their lessons learned. And now, your host, Andrew Jelina. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today on Underserved. Thanks for having me. Um, Certainly a pleasure and very much looking forward to having a great conversation with you and your audience today. Absolutely. You grew up in beautiful Virginia Beach, Virginia. I assume you were enjoying the outdoors and the beach much more than hammering a keyboard. Looking back, I certainly wouldn't say it was the roughest start. Quite the amazing place in terms of having all of the elements uh, that at your disposal, whether that's the mountains that aren't far away or the ocean. But uh, yeah, tech wasn't my first thoughts when I was younger. It was probably the beach and the ocean. Now, you had some full-time jobs pretty much when you were in high school, right? Yeah, I mean, I think early on came from a sort of a military family. Interesting background in terms of sort of the home life. Didn't have a lot of money. Didn't have a lot of resources at my disposal. So, you know, my mom was pretty straight with me and said, if you want different things in your life, you have to learn pretty early that you're going to have to go work for it. So it started off early for me. Of course, like any teenager, hey, I want that freedom. I want a car. I want uh, to be able to go to the beach and do things with my friends and play sports and, and have all these different things. And I had to get a job. I did the same thing. I see you were a dishwasher at a restaurant. I did that as well. What other jobs are you doing back then? Yeah. I mean, you look back and you kind of just you chuckle and laugh a little bit to yourself in terms of the journey that we all take in life. And I think, you know, mine in particular was, you know, whether it was a dishwasher at a restaurant until sometimes one or two in the morning and getting up and going to school again at eight o'clock in the morning and after school going to football practice or soccer practice and then going and working again. So rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. I think I had sort of a spectrum of jobs, which I think all brought different sort of value propositions and learning experiences that you don't really see until you're old. Older. McDonald's isn't so bad on the surface, but I think when you choose a McDonald's down at the beach where there's not many other restaurants and there's no public toilets, McDonald's becomes sort of the catch all. Little Caesars Pizza. I worked at car dealerships cleaning cars. I spent one summer doing roofing, which is probably, you know, kudos to those individuals because that has to be some of the hardest physical, just relentless work you can ever do. And dangerous. Super dangerous. You know, but look, when you're young, you look at the world like you're invincible. You know, hey, look at me. I can be up here in my tennis shoes with no ropes and I'm so cool because I'm invincible. And that's just sort of the naiveness of that younger sort of age. Built docks, not like sort of docks for boats into the water. Worked at a bar as a bar back, which is interesting because you hear a lot of stories from people. So, I, you know, look, I jumped around from a few different jobs over the course of three to four years while I was in high school. Many of them were simultaneous while I was, you know, sort of going full time to school. But every job I look back on taught me something, you know, whether I was dishwasher or whether I was making a pizza or washing a car, no matter what I did, I always had this sort of personal goal of my own to be the best at it. If I'm going to wash dishes, I want to be the best best dishwasher this place has seen. Whatever it may have been, I always set myself a personal goal to sort of just be the best at it, even though I knew it wasn't forever. Now, one fateful day, the landline phone, remember those, in your house rings, and uh, what happens? sort of transitioning from the first journeys for me professionally and all my different jobs as a teenager, I didn't really have strong ambitions early on to sort of think about what's next. I was really living in the moment, you know, just having fun and not really thinking so much about college or any kind of vocation necessarily. And yeah, one day I was getting ready to walk out the door to football practice and the phone rings. And uh, yeah, it was one of the landlines with the long, long cord on it that stretched all the way across the kitchen. And I remember getting ready to walk out the door and I look back at the phone and I'm like, wow, I just let it go. You know, like Somebody will get it later or whoever it is will call back. But I, for some reason, walked over and answered and the phone was for me. And gentleman said, uh, you know, is this Mr. Paul Dingwitz? I said, yes, it is. Wow, great. I'm glad I caught you. I have an opportunity for you that we should talk about. He said, uh, I'm Sergeant so-and-so from the U.S. Army. And immediately in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, here we go. Right. We're going into sales mode. And before I could even utter the words of, hey, thanks for your time, but I have to go. He just kept talking. Right. So he went into sell mode. He didn't take a breath so I could in- inject myself and say no thanks. So I, I got to give him kudos because he was smart. And he really just sort of latched on to my sort of thought processes and said, hey, are you what's next for you? And I paused and said, you know, I'm not sure. And what if I could convince you that the army might be for you and all you have to do is take an aptitude test? I think it's called the ASVAB. At this point, I'm just trying to get off the phone, right? I'm just like, yeah, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, sounds interesting. And I committed to taking this test. 
That is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, known more colloquially, as you said, as the <laughs> ASVAB. How'd you do? So on the ASVAB in particular, my scores were good enough to where the recruiter called me a few days later and said, hey, come on in and see me. I'd like to sort of talk to you about opportunities. You know, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come in. I probably rescheduled the appointment a couple of times, hoping that maybe he would stop calling. But ultimately, I went in, he, you know, I still remember I, I go into the office and he's clean cut and he's, you know, he's athletic build and very formal looking. And uh, he puts this big book down in front of me because all the military information back in those days, big sort of manuals and books. Through some sort of theatrical event, he opens it up and just starts flipping through the pages. And I said, you know, what's this? He says, well, this is the book of MOSs or, or jobs. What job do you want? And I said, well, what are you offering? And he said, well, based on your scores, not every job, but you can almost pick just about anything in here that you'd like. And that kind of started the conversation. You know, he threw out a couple different things to me. And I think the landing spot was satellite communication, radio, cryptology, those kinds of things had my attention. Computers were not necessarily on my radar back then. You commit to some sort of job. And then what happens is they send you to this sort of registration event where you go and you get sworn in and you think psychologically that I can't get out of this. I've committed myself. I've come up here. I've signed the paperwork. And then I went back to my friends and I said, hey, yeah, I just signed up for the army and signed up for this job. And they were like, whoa, what are you doing? right? Like, don't do this. This is a mistake and your life's going to change and you're not going to have fun. And why would you do this? So then I got cold feet and I called the recruiter up and I said, Hey, my friends said that this is a bad decision for me and that I can get out of this. And of course the guy tried to talk me off of it immediately. He said, no, no, you can't get out of it. You signed your name. But at the end of the day, I was legally allowed to get out of it. And a month went by and I'm, you know, I'm having fun and I'm working and I'm, you know, look, I'm still being a relatively responsible young teenager. And then one night I was sitting there just, you know, with some friends and we were just doing nothing. We were just sitting around doing nothing, maybe having some drinks like teenagers do and thinking we were cool and we had the whole world figured out. And it just hit me. And I just sat there and I said, you know what? I've got to get back on that horse. And I think that I don't have another plan. So I've got to take this journey. Called the recruiter up and said, hey, I'd like to recommit myself. And that was it. He let me come back in and sign the paperwork. His tone changed with me a little bit after that. I think I burned a trust with him just a little bit. But uh, yeah, that was the beginning. And so what is your first MOS? What are you doing when you're in there? Essentially, when you go in, you go to school and you train for a while and you learn the spectrum of things from radios to satellites to communication technologies. You also learn about some basic cryptology and things like that. And that's what I started doing. Signal communication, satellite trans, retrans, the encryption or the cryptology about that as well was also a part of that. I went to some advanced training on some of the satellite retrans stuff and things like that. So that was my first sort of job. You know, in the military, you don't really get to choose what or where you go. One day I'm sitting there and there was this phone number you could call and you could punch in your social security number. Everything in the military was based around your social security number. You even put it on your duffel bags. And we were just joking around one day and this guy goes, you know, there's a phone number you can call and you punch in your social security number and it tells you if you're on orders to go somewhere. So we jokingly started calling this phone number and <laughs> ironically it says, you're on orders for Germany. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. I just had a new girlfriend. She's pregnant. We're both in the military together. We're not married yet. So this made it quite interesting in terms of like legally and from a from a family perspective, we're not seen as one family. We're just seen as two single people. I'm on this phone number. It's all automated, right? So that nobody answers. You just call and it tells you where you're going and says, you're, you're leaving for Germany in four months. And that was how that journey started. What's it like when you get to Germany? Look, first of all, Germany, great mass transportation. Germany, you don't even need a car because there's so many trains and so many ways to get around, like buses, like don't waste your time taking your car. You kind of get there and then they kind of say, okay, well, this is where you're going, right? This is the station you're going to. And I didn't have enough research or enough knowledge that they were sending me down to Bavaria, which is in the Southeast corner of Germany, to the littlest, smallest bases that they had, two of them, I think it was called Vilsick and Grafenbeer. And needless to say, you needed a car because there was these little like quiet towns in the middle of nowhere. And if you didn't have a car, you were just stuck. And then you ended up just calling in favors to ride with your buddies. So I get there. I realized pretty quickly, one, that tanks make loud noises when they shoot their guns. So this was a mechanized infantry unit and they would do night drills. So in the first week I was there all night long, I'm in, I'm in this barracks building. So you have your own room, but you and a couple hundred of your closest friends are all staying there as well. And you're sleeping and it's nice and it's comfortable and you're waiting uh, for the next day to come. And all of a sudden, boom, boom for hours and the whole building shaking. I think the first weekend was sort of that. And I hadn't yet gotten my job. So then the Monday came around and I met with my commander and the commander said, what's your MOS? And I said, oh, it's this. And he goes, yeah. Hmm. What do you know about computers? Not much. 
okay, well, we have this job, computer specialist, whatever it may be. There's nobody in the pipeline to come and fill this job. It's a new role within the army, generally speaking, and you're going to do it. Of course, you know, back then, which may be different now, you don't really ask, you just get told. Keep in mind, I was 19 and like an E2, right? So my rank was super low. I was nobody. I didn't know anything. And that was how it started. I just spent, I don't know, 12 to 15 hours a day breaking and fixing, reformatting the MBR and the master boot record and all this old school stuff. When you, when you mess up the operating system, you start from scratch and do it again, do it again. You are listening to the Underserved Podcast. Underserved is produced by Maris Consulting Group, embracing the power of people in technology. For more information, visit MarisCG.com. That's M-A-R-I-S-C-G.com. So after you get this experience, uh, being in the Army is not terribly lucrative. I imagine that you are tempted to go private. Yeah. So back then, you know, when you started going through some of these trainings and different things, civilian companies, you know, sort of got wind of people who were doing these types of things and they would approach you sometimes indirectly and say, you know, if you weren't in the military, I would be happy to hire you or, or, you know, we can pay you more. So we all hit these crossroads in life. My grandfather was military. My brother was military. They were sort of lifers, so to speak, in terms of like re-upping. And I hit this point of, do you re-up or do you get out and go to these private companies that are chasing talent like you have? And I think for me, part of the military that was attractive was the discipline that was there, the appreciation that I learned, the fitness that I was in. I could eat whatever I wanted and then still be in great shape because you exercised every day. So I could eat horribly bad and be in great shape still. So I really like some of those things. I love the fact that I was getting to see different parts of the world, which I never thought I could do. But what I didn't like is that you don't really get to think for yourself, right? You're told when to get up, where to be, when to be there, what to eat, when, where to stand, clean this, clean this again, clean this again. Why are we cleaning it again? Because there's nothing else to do. And I said, do it again. So for me, the way that I am in terms of a person, I struggled with illogical demands, right? They're trying to psychologically break you. If you ever have to be on the battleground, then you are fit for purpose, right? And you're your mind is strong. And no matter what they throw at you, whatever circumstances, you'll be good. So, you know, look, all that helped. But ultimately, I knew that I didn't want to do it for a career. I jumped and went back to the U.S. And yeah, and I started my professional journey uh, living in Kentucky, but working in Nashville, Tennessee. And what are you doing in Nashville? Who are you working for? It was a media company that was based in Nashville. So it was an hour commute each way. It was a company that uh, had facilities to do television commercials, music videos, and I was their network engineer and systems administrator. And again, I was starting from scratch, right? I mean, I came into this company. I was the sort of the new guy. I was in this weird world of being able to make my own decisions. You know, I can make my own decisions on what I work on. This is super foreign to me. But quickly, what I realized is um, not only was I being exposed to something I was super comfortable with, which was the sort of the network and the systems administrative stuff and the firewalls and all those general things, but I was also getting exposed to this broadcast facility, which had a ton of other cool technical gadgets and workflows and systems that I had never heard of or seen before. So you learn a bunch about broadcast there, kind of cut your teeth in that industry, but a new CEO kind of changes the cadence. Yeah, it was an interesting journey, right? So I think you look back and, you know, the horrible part was you were at the bottom of the pole. The great part about it was I got to make so many relationships, right? So as being the sort of systems administrator or help desk person at sometimes, you get to go and you get to meet with everybody, whether it's the CEO or the chief marketing officer, you have a relationship with everybody. But I was learning every day from everybody at every level. A new CEO came in, maybe my last year there. I remember distinctly, we had a company meeting, an all-hands meeting, and we had offices in multiple cities. And, you know, it's normal. Right? Every quarter we have this all-hand review meeting. We talk about how we performed. Check, check, move on. And we, we start this meeting and the guy, um, the essence was, he said, generally speaking, we did pretty well this quarter. We again, hit our goals are pretty close. And then he quickly transitioned into a doomsday, which was, oh, by the way, I've recommended to the board that we sell the company or shut it down. And uh, we see all sort of operations as we know it in the next three to four weeks. Many of you only have two weeks left to be employed, but by the way, we wanted to give you some time to find something else so you can continue to work for two weeks. I was one of those two-week notice uh, individuals because I was just that far down on the pole. Most of the technology people were on that list. Just before the CEO had announced this dramatic 
shift in uh, sort of longevity or lack of longevity, the vice president of engineering, broadcast engineering, who had just had a bunch of interactions with supporting him and his team over the last couple years. He had already moved on to a new company called Pinnacle Systems up in New Jersey. He was trying to sort of recruit me, but I was, you know, look, my family was in Nashville. I had young children. This whole thing of changing jobs was scary for me. I didn't know I, I was comfortable where I was. I was learning a lot and I didn't value so much the skills that I had learned about the broadcast engineering. CEO says, shut it down. The next step I make out of out of that room is to call the VP of engineering at, at the new company, Pinnacle Systems. And I said, remember that job you were talking about wanting me to work? I, I'll take it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't I don't know what it was. I don't know what it pays. Whatever it is, I'll take it. Right. I have to I have to provide for my family. That's my focus. Right. So all of my objections and reservations have gone to the side. <laughs> it is time to provide. They all mean nothing in this very moment. Right. So <laughs> So yeah. Pinnacle Systems, did they make Pinnacle Studio? They do. They did. Yes. That was their consumer product. Yeah. They were based uh, up in New Jersey, New York area. I think they probably had some other offices, if I remember. But uh, Rochelle Park, New Jersey was where my group was based. So you're at an exciting time when they're moving to digital um, off of like the tape to tape stuff. And what's that like? Yeah. So Pinnacle in particular was doing uh, not just their consumer products, but they were also doing broadcast integration. So they were doing like broadcast facility redesigns and migrations and things. So I went up there to work on their team that was producing and building sort of end to end digital. Right. So at that particular point, as you mentioned, was a transition point from tape to tape in the broadcast world in particular. So now we're sort of away from the technology realm a little bit. But in the broadcast world, they were very much focused on how do we go from old traditional tape to tape, very manual sort of workflows to all digital. Now and that's what I did. I went up there and I was a you know project engineer, systems engineer, uh, and integrations engineer for Pinnacle. And I ran around in early days. Got to work at New York One, doing some stuff there. Got to work at you know ABC, NBC, CBS, all the different places up there that we were trying to either pitch to or we were actively working with. Again, didn't realize it. Was learning so much just through association and so much through circumstance and got to meet so many people that, you know, it wasn't intentional. You just end up in a room with vice presidents and presidents and CTOs and CEOs, and you're just overwhelmed. But yeah, it was interesting. So you end up being trusted by these high level people after working with them a bunch of times and being comfortable enough to tell them what you know and tell them what you don't know. Who is one of their big customers that kind of shapes things for the future? So one of the big customers that we landed early days was CNN. And it was an interesting journey for Pinnacle as a company because, you know, this was this sort of broadcast integration. Um, they weren't the biggest player in this space, but they wanted to be. You know, you can take a couple different approaches in, in life or in work. And one of the approaches is let's start small and build big. Let's learn a lot and then let's build up that muscle and let's become great at it. And then we'll go after the CBSs and the Fox News and the CNNs. Back then, if I remember correctly, it was the opposite. It was how great would it be that we can say that we work with CNN or that we say that we work with ABC or some of the big sort of top tier networks. So let's go into CNN and let's pitch them and let's get super aggressive on the pricing and let's convince them that we can do this. And, and look, Pinnacle had some great products and they had some great people. And I was fortunate enough because I still lived in Nashville, Tennessee. I was commuting up to New Jersey, New York every week to work. So every other weekend I would go home just because of the proximity of where I lived, because most of my team members lived up in the New York, New Jersey area. They said, hey, we're going to do a project with CNN. And since you're so close, you're not our most senior guy, but uh, you're competent and you're close. So you're going to be on this team. And I worked for Pinnacle, but I worked at CNN and I worked on premise there and I worked helping to build their full digital infrastructure out, which was all server-based. It was all network-based with redundancy and everything. So it was, you know, taking the technology world and the broadcast workflows and putting them together, which was a super unique situation. Now, you had a story there uh, during a train the trainer session. We can all look back and say, remember this time and remember this point in my life or this point in my work journey. And that was definitely one of those. So, you know, part of my role there was sort of a catch all. And the catch all was, look, you're here to do whatever's asked of you. So if it's integration work, do it. If it's racking servers, do it. Just make it work. You know, this is a 20, 30, 35 million dollar project. We can't mess it up. And part of what my role was, is was training the trainer or training some of the key individuals within CNN. Great people, super competent. Nobody ever trained me on how to be a trainer. Nobody ever gave me feedback or sessions or training sessions on. I just had to wing it and I just had to just do it in the moment. And it was super challenging, but I developed sort of a passion for it. So, you know, I'm young. 
relatively speaking. And I, you know, I think probably more invincible than I am. And back then remote control software was big. And I think we were using something like Dameware or TeamViewer or something. You know, you open up these remote sessions, these remote desktop sessions to all these different systems. And some of the systems are production systems and some of them are development or training systems. And the naming convention of those is always pretty similar. So I'm doing my training and we get done with the training and I've just conquered the world, right? I've just given training to a group full of people that are super smart and they were all happy with it. And I'm feeling on cloud nine, hey, by the way, all the metadata, like all the information we just put into the training session, not to worry. It's not going to clog up the system. We can get rid of it. All we have to do, and we can even be super destructive. Do you guys want to see how super destructive we can be? Sure. Let's see. If you go into the database via command line and you do delete star dot star or whatever the command was at the time, <laughs> it blows everything away. We can do that. And they were like, really? I was like, oh yeah, watch delete. And at that particular point, I realized something was wrong (laughs) because the return of that command should have been really quick because the database was quite small. But what actually happened was it took seconds or 10 seconds to come back and it said something like 300,000 rows were affected (laughs) or something crazy like that. First thing I did was I looked at the name of the system that I was in and it was blurry because I was probably starting to get into tears. But I realized that I was on the production system when I did that, not the training system, because I had multiple windows open. You just did it, right? Like everything that you ever did as a child, everything, every time you lied to your parents, every time you snuck out of the house, like this is karma. I had to pause for a second and I just went into like solution mode and I said, okay, what do I do? And the very first thing I did was I called back up to New Jersey to the team at Pinnacle and I said, oh my God, you don't, thank you for answering the phone. It's Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm surprised you're still at the office. Oh my God, thank you. Let me tell you what I just did. And she went, oh, okay. And I said, please tell me this is not catastrophic. And she said, well, as long as the database replication is set up, everything's in sync, we should be able to restore it within a couple seconds of where you deleted it. Uh, let, Let me just jump in remotely and do it. So thank God remote technology was there. Thank God she was at her desk. So then the very next step was I had to look in the mirror and say, go take responsibility. So I walked down the hallway to, I think it was the VP of media. And I basically said, hey, John, I said, I just did something incredibly stupid. And I just said, hey, I deleted the production database and we're working to restore it and it should be back up shortly. But I made a big mistake. I mean, still looking back to this, it just seems surreal because, I mean, you're talking about the biggest news network in the world and you just basically demolish their database within five seconds. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Talk about career ending, right? Like, true. Hey, sport. How was school today? It was okay, Dad. How was work? Ugh. Actually, I had a rough day. Leading an engineering team is hard. I mean, I have to ship new software, meet deadlines, and tackle new projects while keeping my team focused on the day-to-day. It's hard to keep up. Jeepers, Dad. (laughs) Why don't you call Maris? They're the staffing firm with the best technical resources around. They helped Billy's dad. He used to be stressed out like you. He was missing deadlines, his team was overworked, and a bunch of folks left the company because it was too stressful. But then he called Maris. And they put resources to work right away. He hit all his deadlines and freed up his team to do other work. His boss was so happy that Billy's dad got some extra time off time off? Wow. What did he do with that? He spent it with Billy. That's a swell idea, son. I'll call Maris today. Now, you go wash up for supper. Not only is it not end your career, you end up having a great relationship with John. He says, you know what? I want you to be here working at CNN. Yeah. Super crazy turn of events, right? So, you know, he comes back and of course, as he should, as I would expect him, he says, Hey, that was incredibly dumb, but I can appreciate the fact that you took responsibility for it. And I assume Paul that you've learned. I said, absolutely. And maybe it was a few months later after this incident, but uh, basically he said, Hey, look, We're not done with the integration yet, but we know that we want you here at CNN to help us with our journey. Don't know where, how you would fit yet, but I want you here. At that particular time, there was another interesting sort of conundrum sort of happening, which was Avid and Pinnacle were talking about a merger. That was happening in the background. Slowly, I was working with the CNN staff to sort of find my place. I think they were you know, having some trouble finding a place for me. They basically said, we want him, but we don't know where, so just find a spot for him. And uh, there was a hiring manager that came to me and said, you know, we need to have a discussion 
or an interview, I was told in no uncertain terms, I need to hire you. So let's talk. And during that time, I didn't know the role. And she said, hey, I run a team basically of Linux, Solaris, Unix admins. And here I was, I was a Windows guy. Every Windows guy's nightmare. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I was like, um, sure. You know, what's the term? Imposter syndrome. <laughs> so I was like, what do you do here? So yeah, I moved over and uh, I went into a team of senior Linux Unix, Solaris admins that have been doing it for years. And here I was, a transplant of somebody the organization wanted, but maybe not necessarily somebody that group wanted in terms of my background and skill set. So you figure out, though, how to have a symbiotic relationship with Yannan? Yeah, Yannan was an interesting cat, right? You know, back then we, we sat in cubicles. So unless you were a manager, you had a cubicle, which was, uh, hey, I have my own personal space. And I even have a little cubby that I can lock. This is cool. And I sit down my first day and you know, Yannan comes over, he's my cube mate. So he's in the cube next to me and he's on my team and he's a highly skilled, competent Linux, Unix engineer and comes over and he's like, you know, here's your shared key and here's this and here's your this and, and here's how you access all these things and here's the systems and here's your jump host and here's, <laughs> he just starts like going in and I'm just looking at him like everything he was saying was foreign. And it really was actually. And then he paused for a second. He goes, hold on a second. Like, what's your background? I said, not this. <laughs> He just shook his head and he had a degree, I believe, in nuclear physics hmm. and, and a PhD in this. And I used to call him Dr. Yannan. And a short story is I was thrown into the deep end on this particular job. I was still doing a lot with the Pentacle systems and integration work, but a lot, a large part of my job was doing Linux administration across the infrastructure at CNN. And Yannan held my hand and he gave me a lot of mentorship and a lot of guidance. And I learned in the moment. And yes, probably early days I had imposter syndrome because I was so far out on my skis in terms of my capability versus what I was being asked to do. And I just dug deep and I worked really hard and Yannin would help me technically and I would help him in terms of his voice. So by, by nature, he was a quiet guy, highly respected technically in the organization. And, you know, he would always have things that he would feel passionate about to voice his opinion, but he never had that that sort of extroverted personality. So he would come to me and say, Paul, I need you to go share this thought or this feeling or to say this on my behalf. So he never wanted to do it himself. So you do well enough there. You figure it out. You become a good sysadmin. And then folks that you had known from earlier in your career seek you out with a part-time gig. Yeah. So if thinking back to the Quest Digital Media days, there was a CEO that was there early days at Quest Digital Media. Again, just by happenstance. I just happened to sort of know him a little bit, spent some time in his office, gave him support. I was a good guy to him. I was open, honest, never really thought much about it. And then I'm at CNN, phone rings. There was a guy that I had worked with at Quest Digital Media, Mike Medley. And Mike said, hey, the CEO that was here before is doing a startup business. He needs some competent people. He mentioned you. I mentioned you. What do you think? And I said, well, first of all, I have a family. I have a family and I'm sorry, I just can't jump from something as stable as CNN to the startup, but I'm interested to see if I can do it on top. And he said to me, you have a family, you have a full-time job and you think you can do this on top. And I said, let's try. And here we were, the three of us essentially, you know, all sort of sweat equity. So me and Mike, we worked together at Quest Digital. Me and Mike were still friends. Mike was the software developer in the background, writing all the sort of the, the backend code. And I was doing all the integration work. And while I was working at CNN, I would go to CNN probably from seven in the morning until three or four in the afternoon. And then from three or four in the afternoon until midnight or longer, I would do the startup business. And it was a streaming media, live sporting event, pay-per-view company called B2 Networks. And I did this out of my basement for well over a year before it became to the point where it could uh, sustain itself. So you're not only moonlighting and working eight or nine hours a day there, you're hosting it out of your basement. You got all this gear in there. You got your friends and family working on this. Like, what do you guys end up grinding out? Like, what are some of the cool things that you did at B2? So it was grassroots. Like seriously, it was shoestring budget. We got some investors, but we're talking about, you know, fifties or hundreds of thousands, not millions. So we had to do it paycheck to paycheck. It was don't pay your invoices, but pay your people. It was that sort of like month to month and built out my basement, my house, put four DSL circuits in there for redundancy, put a two cable modem. So the, the local internet providers for sort of residential internet, when they came to install it, they were like, what are you trying to do here? This is not normal. Then I called the electrician and said, Hey, I have 200 amps. I need 200 more. And he goes, who needs that much power to their house? And I said, well, 
I have a plan. So I built out basically a network operations center in my basement, had 40 monitors, 40 computers, six desks, just fully specced. We ran operations out of there. And while we're doing that, we also simultaneously ran around the country, all over the U.S. I've probably been to every state in the U.S. And we installed streaming media servers with camera systems and audio systems in arenas, professional arenas and collegiate arenas all over the country. So eventually you guys kind of combined with another company, One Media, and are doing this mm-hmm. same sort of streaming idea. But this is back when like, I remember like H264 was like barely a thing at the time. Like, how are you figuring yeah. out how to make all this open source stuff work? Yeah, there's a little bit of a journey there, right? I mean, I think early days, we kind of had to go with out of the box stuff. So back then you had, I mean, oh man, this is going to tell how old I am. Uh, Real media, you remember Real Media? Mm -hmm. All right, so Real Media was a thing. Then we started looking at uh, Windows Media Encoder and Windows Media Encoder had its own codecs and different things in there. And then we started looking at Flash Media Encoder and doing Flash. So there was definitely some learnings there and evolution that happened, but we kind of mastered, so to speak, a couple things. We mastered rights. So we were able to go lock up rights for three to five years. So I learned a lot about the business side and the rights acquisition side. And that bought us longevity. And that bought us the fact that we could fake it until we made it and figure it out technically. I was sort of the CTO. We built up the company a little bit more. I had left CNN by this point. B2 is growing. I left CNN because B2 got to the point where it could sustain salaries and it could sustain sort of some sort of cost structure. And then Once we got enough arenas installed and the cash flow was coming in, we said, okay, we have to take this to the sort of the next level. And we started talking to a company called One Media. And we started talking to them about, hey, what if there was a way for us to transmit live or recorded television signals from one part of the world and send them to not just one to one, but one to many. Because traditional satellite, you know, depending on the curvature of the earth, it's got to go up multiple times and down multiple times and becomes quite expensive. And we said, you know, hey, look, we can do this. We're so great at this because we've mastered it on the most basic level at the average sporting arena for the minor league sports. We can do this now at a professional level for television quality. And we convinced one of the major shareholders that invested in B2. He also was a major shareholder. He owned One Media. And we convinced him that we could leverage our streaming media technologies to do live television transmission. So I'm sitting like a mad scientist, nights, days, weekends, in the back room trying to, again, take off-the-shelf servers with off-the-shelf encoding cards from Blackmagic and from all these other providers. And I'm trying to, oh, what's SDI? Oh, we have to do SDI. And what's the Kodak we're going to use? Is it VP9? Is it H.264? How do we put all this together? And, and how do we you know, make it work on not Windows, but Linux? And it was chaotic. We did it as a managed service. So that was the other claim to fame is how do we do this as a managed service? Andrew, you don't have to do anything. We're going to do it all. You just put this box in your network. You plug in the SDI and we just do it all. We'll call you if there's a problem, right? So we we had it figured out. So I went to Asia. I went to the Middle East, Jordan, all over the world, Europe, to these sort of second and third level networks saying, let us solve your cost problem and your distribution problem. We can not only cut down on your cost because we'll send your signal over the public internet. Sounds great, right? There's no security issues with that. Don't worry about it, you know? Oh, by the way, it's not just going to be point to point. We can now get your media to distribution points all over the world simultaneously with minimal latency. And I think the intentions were super good. And I think that with more money and more R&D, it would have been really great. We used it a lot for One Media. So One Media launched their network and they took Asian sports content via this system and they used it to share those signals into the U.S. market. And it worked pretty well, but there were some technical challenges. Yeah, that was definitely the wild and woolly frontier of streaming. Building up all this kind of broadcast knowledge, how exactly do you end up in the fashion industry next? Yeah, look, randomly, so One Media sort of absorbs B2. I had developed a lot of skills on the broadcast side. I wasn't really looking for what was next for me. And the phone rings one day, and it was a recruiter. And they said, hey, we have this really cool tech company up in Boston. And I said, oh, a tech company? Which, you know, is it, is it Google? Is it Apple? What is it? Yeah, it's a company called Rue La La. <laughs> who, is, who is this Rue La La? And they said, oh, well, you know, yeah, it's a tech company. They do fashion, e-commerce fashion, but it's, it's really tech driven. Yeah, I went up and met with the CTO and I met with the leadership and the whole hiring process was quite long and extended. But uh, ultimately, I took that journey again. So sent my oldest daughter off to college. Up to Boston, we went.
What's your first day like at Rue Lala? Like anywhere, I mean, that we go, there's always challenges. And I, I love challenges. And for instance, I don't want to go work for an organization that doesn't have challenges because I like to solve problems. What I didn't understand is that the problems at Rue were bigger than what I thought. So when I interviewed, there was a VP of engineering. And I assumed I was coming as the VP of operations that uh, he would be my peer, my counterpart, and we would just solve the world's problems. I think the first day or the first week I was there, he resigned, right? So he was either already out the door or leaving. And I walked into a total crazy show, right? So you had this sort of the typical engineering throws it over the fence to operations. Operations has to deal with all the on-call stuff and all of the craziness that comes with it. So there's finger pointing, there's a lack of relationships, there's no trust. And oh, by the way, Rue in particular had a very unique technical challenge, which was every day, two or three times per day, they would do what they call flash sales, which essentially becomes a pretty problematic thing technically because you're basically generating buzz and you're generating a sense of urgency for dramatic amounts of people to come to your website in a very short amount of time. So you basically send out an email blast saying, hey, at three o'clock today, we are going to sell discounted shoes or you know whatever the sort of this high-end designer brand may be. And if you don't come fast, you will miss the opportunity to recognize these savings and get these products. And literally, I think the terminology we used was you're basically DDoS attacking your yourself every day because your traffic would go from like nothing to like mammoth and seconds and the systems were just falling over. There was so many layers of caching and there were so many layers of inefficient sort of services that weren't working well together. And as soon as everything starts crashing, your CEO and all of your leadership goes, what's wrong? Fix it. And that's what we did. I went and I jumped in and sort of developed relationships. I sat a lot with the engineering teams, tried to mend the fences between operations and engineering. In the absence of having a strong engineering leader, I spent the first, I don't know, six months just building bridges and trying to develop trust and trying to find common ground. And we slowly, slowly, slowly chipped away at making the platform better. Now, again, your network becomes important because Susan Staniford, who you knew at Rue, moves on from there. She did. Yeah. Susan was the CTO at Rue. She hired me, developed a great relationship with her, trusted her with my eyes closed. Still do to this day. She's a super great friend, mentor, and sort of role model for me. She left Rue because her journey there just sort of run its course and she wanted to go work in Europe. That was her next big sort of journey for herself. And she went to work at Zeal. And at that particular point, Zeal was based in the UK, but they had offices in different countries. She went to Zeal and she was probably gone four or five, six months. And the phone rings one day and she said, hey, you want to come work in Europe? And I said, hey, as much as that sounds cool, that sounds scary as well. Make a long story short, she convinced me at least to jump on a plane and come see what it was about. And so who do you meet in your whirlwind tour? Oh, that's a story, right? That's a story. And it's a story that, funny enough, me and the CEO of Zeal today still laugh about. So at this point, me and Susan never even really talked about the details of the role. We know that we want to solve some problems. Operationally, there's some challenges. Why don't you come talk to some people? And I said, sure, I'll come talk to some people. No problem. Flew to London get off the plane, call her up. She said, hey, check in at the hotel. And then maybe if you have time, just come on over to the office. And I was like, sure, no problem. Come over to the office. No real expectations other than I'm sure I'm just going to randomly meet some people. Literally, Susan's running meeting to meeting as she should be, very busy. She literally grabs me by the hand. We walk down the sort of the hallway and she's looking in each conference room. She's literally going, okay, well, HR is in this room and the CEO is in this room. She goes, hold on a second. She opens the door. She goes, hey guys, this is Paul. You guys should talk. And that was how that went. So we went in the first couple hours I was there, I was randomly put in the room with different people who had no idea really why I was there. And I had no idea really why I was there. And I didn't know their roles and they didn't know what role I was looking for, but we made it work. And I found a way to conversate with them and engage with them until the last meeting of the day. And that was the CEO. And we hop in a room and Susan says, Hey, CEO, hey, Helmet, this is Paul. Paul, this is Helmet, like hop in a room and uh, you guys should talk. He was under the expectation that I was interviewing for a different role that I knew nothing about. It was a head of engineering role to build out games and to build out a whole new platform. So he starts in, and, you know, have you ever built out games before? I said, what? And after about 45 minutes, I could sense the tension in the room. Susan pops her head back in and goes, hey guys, how's it going? And, and Helmet kind of looks at her like, what did you send me into? This guy can't solve any of my problems, right? And, and I'm sitting there looking at her going, I'm jet lagged. And I think this was the worst meeting with anybody I've ever had, right? <laughs> so it, was, it was catastrophic. And needless to say, I hopped back on the plane and didn't hear much for a few months. And then all of a sudden the phone rang again and she said, hey, remember that job in, in London? Let's uh, let's try again. Now I have a role that's clear with clear objectives and everybody's aligned on it. And uh, here we go. So you come on and join pretty quickly, kind of having to do the same stuff you've had to do in other roles, bridging the gap that often exists between ops and engineering and kind of driving things forward, what are some of the highlights that you've had at Seal Group? 
Yeah, look, when I joined, I think a little over seven years ago, it was a much different world than it is today. So back then, we were very sort of fragmented in terms of we had significant groups in Spain, London, Germany, and there was little bits of power struggles, little bits of politics. We had a great business, you know, and the relationships, again, it was not too dissimilar from Rue. You can have really, really strongly qualified people. You can have superstars, but if they don't work well with others and you don't have good chemistry and you don't have good alignment and you don't have, you know, sort of good trust, none of it works. You have to start there. So when I came in, it was really bad. Operations wasn't performing. The infrastructure was really challenging. Engineering over time had just lost faith in operations ability to deliver, and they wanted to outsource it. And here I was. It wasn't just this guy's coming in to sort of try and revive something that we think is dead. This guy's American, right? So this goes a little deeper than that. Right. This isn't just a, hey, is this guy technically competent? Does this guy know what he's doing? This is an American guy who brings a culture that maybe we're not interested, right? Or one that we see from a distance that we think is, you know, not formidable to who we are and what we want to be. Because keep in mind, in America, it can be seen from the outside looking in as a hire and fire culture and you don't really care about people. And and that was part of it. And so part of my challenge wasn't just the disarray that the teams were in. Problem was, you know, uh, to bring our culture and to bring our sort of hire fire mentality because we didn't care about people. And here I was, this military guy who doesn't care about people. That was the stigma. That was the front winds or the, the, the gale force winds that I was walking into. But on your tech journey, you managed to bring these folks together, gain their trust, cut costs in half, double the value delivered. So it got better. Yeah, it got way better, right? And I think it just took time. It just took staying true to your word. The first months I was there, there was people that wouldn't take meetings with me. I would schedule meetings with them and they just wouldn't show up. Uh, They wouldn't really give me the time of day. I had to dig deep. I had to start small. I had to come in and find quick wins. I had to look at who were the influencers and who were the people that were really capable and competent and engage with them and develop relationships with them and convince them to give me a chance in terms of the things that I thought we could accomplish and the things that I thought we could deliver. And I spent the first couple of years just doing that, just small wins that got into medium-sized wins that got into bigger wins. And then people started taking my call. They started having conversations with me and they, they realized that I was if not anything, I was true to my word, you know, and I tried to always hold myself accountable to what I said that we would get done or that I would do. And and that built up trust. And then what happened was we moved the business from the UK to Germany. Susan left. And when she left the organization, there was a pretty big hole. And I just organically stepped in there and started doing more. And funny enough, the German engineering team, they weren't super interested in my role and they weren't super interested in spending a lot of time with me early days. They ultimately reached out and said, hey, we would love it if you would come and work with us and and lead the engineering team. So I, I did that, right? And I developed some great relationships and we solved a lot of problems. And then I stepped into the CTO role at Zeal. And yes, to your point, we trimmed the budget. We not only did that, but our platform is dramatically more capable. We got sucked in early days at Zeal to the enterprise world. We need some big stuff. We need the biggest routers. We need the biggest databases. We need the biggest, the biggest, the biggest. And that didn't solve our problems. We had to be smarter. So over the years, we've now migrated to the cloud, cut our operating costs. We've become way more efficient. Our platform is super capable. And beyond all that, our retention in the culture we've built in technology, I think, is uh, one of the best I've ever seen in my professional career. The people that we have, they're just staying here for a long time because they're super skilled, they're super challenged, and they're great at solving problems. What are you doing when you're not at work? What are you doing for fun? I know you did some competitive racquetball once upon a time. Sadly, racquetball is not that big thing in Europe, right? So there's a lot of other racket sports. Squash is big, but racquetball was big in the U.S. probably in the 70s, 80s, 90s. For the last 10 years or so before I moved to Europe, I played in tournaments every month and I traveled to the U.S. Open and played in the U.S. Open and did lots and lots of things there with racquetball. You know, got to the point where I was, you know, ranked and really, really taking it seriously. Uh, I, I certainly would never sort of paint the picture that I could do it professionally. It was never that good, but it was my secondary passion. I was doing it 12 hours a week, just racquetball 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 moved to europe and there's one racquetball court within two hour distance so i don't play so much now now you said paint the picture i do see on the wall behind you there two brand new pictures tell me about those yeah i mean so look as we get older and our time becomes more limited uh, and our bodies don't hold up so well to the sports uh so racquetball slowed down for me i think covid sort of also made that a challenge so aside from golf which i try to hack around that a little bit in the past months i've sort of piqued a little bit of an interest into acrylic fluid painting basically where you take a 
acrylic paints and you pour them onto a canvas and you can manipulate them with lots of different things, right? Lots of different ingredients like silicone or different sort of chemicals to create all kinds of cool mixtures. And then you can use air or blow dryers or heat guns to make the paint do some really cool things. So I thought watching it on YouTube, that it was going to be easy and fun. Uh, what I quickly realized is it makes an absolute mess. My wife was absolutely not thrilled with that, but the end result is quite satisfying. And it, it also showed me that I have a little bit of a creative nerve in me that I never knew existed. I think in the tech professions, a lot of the times people feel like, oh, I, I don't know if it's okay to ha also have this creative side. And you know, anyone who's an adult is a little reticent to call themselves an artist, but I, I think it's important to have that. That sort of outlet as well as being able to do cool stuff at work or things that are physical and sports and whatever. I think it's an important third facet. Another facet, any charities or causes that you're interested in? You know, I went to private school. Um, we didn't have a lot of money at all. Um, but my mom always tried to teach me, even when we didn't have a lot of money, it was every Sunday or every Wednesday, you're giving, you're giving. Uh, probably for 15 years straight, we sponsored uh, one or two families at any given time in Guatemala. So we got to sort of like watch them sort of grow. And then we'd send letters back and forth. And that was satisfying because I knew that the money that I was giving was going directly to them. And I was able to see the impact of that. And that really meant a lot for me. The families that we got to sponsor for years and years and years and see their kids go to school was great. And I think Maybe the other thing that I really wanted to do aspirationally, but never really got the time to sort of sit down and focus on it was when I was at Rue, one of the things that we did was we would always go volunteer at soup kitchens or at homeless shelters. And, and it was, I always thought it was really cool. And we would do this and it made me think bigger picture, like, hey, how many other social services or uh, community service places need volunteers, but they never are able to sort of get people to come volunteer because even the places we would work at, they always said to us, yeah, we always struggle to get help. So I said, hey, I have a great idea. I'm going to go develop a relationship with as many public service or community service establishments, whether it's homeless shelters or food kitchens or what have you. And I'm going to create a website where the average citizen can come in and volunteer. And basically you would come and you could sign up in your own sort of ge geographical region and say, I want to volunteer my time four hours next week, where can I go? It would be this sort of marketplace of opportunities for you to volunteer. And then I thought, okay, great. Now, how do I gamify it? How do I make it to where if you, Andrew, are a top volunteer of your time, are you recognized amongst your peers in terms of being acknowledged for that? And that's, you know, the, like the next realm of what I was working on in terms of like, how do I create like a star system? And, and Andrew's volunteered 12 times this month. And wow, he's a top performer. And look at him. He's just such a wonderful citizen of the Massachusetts area. And the sad answer is, is that all these great ideas, I still have them. I just haven't prioritized putting it into motion. But I do think something like that could work anywhere in the world. I think it could too. And you're never too late. Like I said, it's a great idea. So if somebody figures it out and they would like to give me some pointers or partner, let me know. Absolutely. So Paul, thank you so much for joining us and sharing with the listeners of Underserved your experiences. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, look, I really appreciate your time today and your listeners' time. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, Andrew, throughout this journey, getting to listen to many of the podcasts and sessions you've had on Underserved, some really, really interesting interviews and discussions there. So you've certainly brought an awareness for me and how great a lot of your content is. So I really appreciate the opportunity not only to do this podcast with you, but also learn about a lot of the other content and discussions that you've had with other great and insightful individuals. So very much appreciate your time. Well, we appreciate you as a guest and now as a new fan of the show. And we'll talk to everyone soon on the next episode of Underserved. Thank you for listening to the Underserved podcast. For more information on the topics discussed and for show notes, visit the show website, underserved.fm. And please be sure to rate, like, and subscribe to Underserved on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.